from chapter 23 of our Corman Manual. This is a presentation on chemical warfare. Now, chapter 23 covers chemical, biological, and radiological warfare, but uh, this presentation will be just focused on chemical warfare. I'll uh, put out more presentations on the biological and radiological warfare individually. Chemical warfare has probably been around since the beginning of warfare. Man has always been trying to find a more creative way to kill, its, uh, kill each other. Uh, our book lists examples of spears being dipped in poison, Spartans lighting sulfur on fire to create toxic fumes, and even talks about the first large-scale use of chemical agents in World War I and the Battle of Ypres in Bel uh, Belgium, where the Germans used chlorine gas, and it turned out to be more successful than they anticipated it being. A broad overview of the general classes of chemical weapons. We classify them as nerve agents, blister agents, blood agents, pulmonary agents, and riot control agents. We can further classify chemical weapons as lethal versus non-lethal. And a chemical weapon would be classified as lethal if it causes a casualty rate of greater than 10%. All right? If it has a casualty rate greater than 10%, that is considered a lethal agent. We can also classify our chemical weapons on the grounds of whether or not they are persistent or non-persistent. When we say something's persistent, it sticks around in the environment. It lingers for a long time. And when we say it's non-persistent, it dissipates quickly. It goes away very quickly. Equipment available to us to detect the presence of chemical uh, weapons include your M9 paper, your M8 paper, and your M256 Alpha-1 detector kit. Your M9 paper is the most widely used method for detecting liquid chemical agents. Anytime you see the most in your readings, highlight that because that makes a very easy exam question. What is the most widely used method of detecting liquid chemical agents? Your M9 paper, the most widely used method. Your M9 paper is going to turn pink, red, reddish brown, or purple in the presence of blister or nerve agents, but it does not differentiate between blister or nerve agents, and that can be troublesome as we go to find out later on that blister agents are classified as non-lethal, but our nerve agents are very lethal. So it's important to know the difference between these two. All right, and again, these your M9 and your M8 paper, they detect the presence of a liquid chemical. So M8, it can differentiate. It's going to turn gold or yellow whenever it is exposed to G-class nerve agents. And it's going to turn olive or verdana green if it's in the presence of VX gas. And again, your M8 and your M9, that's for liquid chemical agent. Your M256 Alpha-1 detector kit, well, this is a portable kit that detects nerve gas, mustard gas, and cyanide. So this can actually detect vapors. It has some ampules of what are called substrates that are crushed onto a paper, and you expose them to vapors that you're, you know, that are you're suspicious of, and they take about 15 minutes. And if a reaction occurs, that means that 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 agent is probably in the environment. So your M9 paper, it'll look similar to this. You'll expose it to the liquid in question, and it's either going to turn pink, reddish brown, red, or purple. And it's going to detect either a nerve agent or a mustard agent, but you cannot differentiate. Okay, These colors do not mean a specific agent. It just means that either a nerve or a blister agent is present in a liquid form. Your mustard agent, well, as you can see right here, it's got a little key. So it can turn yellow when we have a G-class nerve agent. It'll turn green in the presence of a VX gas. And then it'll turn red in the presence of a blister agent. And then your M256 Alpha-1 detector kit, it ha it's a whole kit with all different kinds of ampules of substrates that you put on the paper. And you just have to follow the instructions that are, that are right there. It'll let you know. It's got a key to let you know what agent you know, indicates what color. And again, the advantage of this, well, multiple agents, and um, it can, uh, it can, you can uh, test a vapor out as well, not just a liquid. When it comes to personal protection, we've got our PPE, our personal protective equipment, our mission-oriented protected posture, or MOP, and the M291 skin decontamination kit. 
Your PPE is going to include your Joint Lightweight Integrated Suit Technology, or your JS List, and also your M40 Chemical Biological Mask, your gas mask. MOP levels, well, these are levels 0 through 4 that give a commander a range of choices regarding the level of chemical protection he or she wants implemented. And we'll go into the MOP levels a little bit more on the next slide here. Your M291 Skin Decontamination Kit is a kit we use to decontaminate skin when we you know, suspect that it is exposed to a chemical agent. Uh, we find that decontamination of a chemical agent on the skin within one minute is perhaps 10 times more effective than if decon is delayed for five minutes. Uh, we can refer to NAVMAD P5041 for more instructions on how to use the M291 Skin Decontamination Kit. Like we mentioned on the previous slide, we have levels to mission-oriented protective posture. We've got MOP levels. Starting with zero, zero is a level, one, two, three, and four. What these levels correspond to is how much of our PPE we are wearing. So MOP level zero, like I said, is a level. The higher we go up in level, the more of this PPE we are going to wear. So talking about MOP level zero, our suit is gonna be available. Our boots are going to be available. Our mask is going to be carried. We'll always carry the gas mask when we are in any mop level. Our gloves will be available and our antidote will be available. When we go into mop level one, well, we are now going to wear our, our uh, suit. We are going to carry our boots. We are going to carry our mask. We're going to carry our gloves and we are going to carry our antidote. When we go into mop level two, we're going to wear a garment. We are going to wear our boots. We are going to carry our mask, continue carrying our mask. We are going to carry our gloves and we're going to be carrying our antidote. Bump it up to mop level three. We're still wearing our suit, still wearing our boots. Now we're putting our mask on and we're still carrying our gloves and we're still carrying our antidote. Mop level four, right? The most protection. Well, we're wearing our suit. We're wearing our boots. We're wearing our mask. We're wearing our gloves and we're still carrying our antidote. And it makes sense if you think about it. You wanna get as much on you know, preemptively before you put the mask on because it's gonna limit your visibility, but you don't want your gloves on before you put the mask on because it's gonna make it, it's gonna delay you putting the mask on because when gas is called, you wanna be able to get that mask on in a hurry. So real quick, uh, when we get into mop level one, so mop level zero, everything's available, mask is carried, right? When we go into mop level one, we throw on our suit, mop level two, we throw on our boots, mop level three, we throw on our mask, and then mop level four, we throw on our gloves. So suit, boots, mask, gloves, Susie, bakes, me, brownies. I'm sure you guys have probably heard some dirty ones out there before, especially on the FMF side. So going back to our chemical agents, we had our nerve agents, we had our blister agents, we got our blood agents, pulmonary agents, and riot control agents. Let's get into the nerve agents specifically. So nerve agents were actually created by a German scientist named Gerhard Schrader. And what Gerhard Schrader was trying to do, he's trying to make a more efficient pesticide. He was actually trying to fight world hunger. And he made the first nerve agent called Taboon, and we'll talk about this in a minute. And he didn't realize what he had on his hands. As a matter of fact, he spilled a little bit in his laboratory and hospitalized himself for about three weeks when he created this agent. This was at the time when Nazi Germany was coming into power. They got wind of this and they, you know, used him to develop weapons along with some other scientists. But Gerhard Schrader is the father of the nerve agents. So nerve agents. Uh, the first one that was discovered was Taboon, which we use the NATO code GA. After that, also um, created by Schrader and some other scientists was Sarin. As a matter of fact, the word Sarin comes from the name of the scientist. Like the S comes from, you know, Schrader. One of the other scientists who was working on it was named Otto Ambrose. That's where the A comes from. I can't remember the rest of the letters, but the, the letters of Sarin correlate to the scientists who created it. This Sarin was the second nerve agent created. Soman, GD, Cyclosarin, and then VX gas. These are all our nerve agents. And 
we call them these G agents. They call these like this GA, GV, GD, GF. These are what are called the NATO codes because these, these agents aren't named the same in every language, but NATO uses these codes for specific types of these gases. And the GA actually comes from German agent. These are German agents. So the first, very first one created, Taboon, GA stood for German agent. Then we went into GB, GD, and GF for all the nerve agents. And then VX isn't really considered a German agent. I'm not sure who created VX. Um, so pharmacologically, we call the nerve agents cholinesterase inhibitors. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail on what that means to be a cholinesterase inhibitor in a second here. Their characteristics are that they are odorless, colorless. They can be deployed as a liquid or a vapor or, you know, like a gas, and they re readily penetrate your clothing. So you, if we're not in the mop suit, they're going to penetrate our normal clothing. Signs and symptoms of a nerve agent exposure are going to vary whether or not you're exposed to a vapor or a liquid. And it's also going to vary whether or not your exposure was small or large. So small exposure to a vapor, we're going to have what's called my meiosis, right? And what meiosis is, is pinpoint pupils. The pupils are going to constrict really, really small. We're going to have some rhinorrhea. And rhinorrhea is just a nice way of saying a runny nose. And then you're going to see some mild difficulty breathing. With the large exposure, we're going to get meiosis, we're going to get a sudden loss of consciousness, we're going to go into convulsions, we're going to go into apnea, then after that we're going to go into flaccid paralysis, and we're going to have copious secretions. It's not mentioned in this chapter, but um, this, is very sim this is the same thing that happens when somebody gets poisoned with an organophosphate, because like organophosphates are the main ingredients in pesticides. So you might see these agents in somebody who are these symptoms, excuse me, in somebody who's putting down pesticides. And we there's a common acronym called sludgem, right, for salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastrointestinal cramping, emesis, and defecation, right, sludgem. Um, it's not in the book for this chapter, but that's what we see with nerve agents exposures because it's the same thing uh, as getting poisoned by a pesticide but just on a much larger scale those original nerve agents somebody was trying to make better pesticides all right and then with our liquid we're going to have we're going to talk about small exposure versus large exposure well we're going to have localized conditions with our small exposure so you have localized sweating where the agent you know came in contact with your skin we're going to see some nausea we're going to see some vomiting and we're going to see some weakness and then our large exposure of a liquid is going to be the same as our large exposure of a, um, of a vapor. So we're going to have sudden loss of consciousness, convulsions, apnea, flaccid paralysis, and those copious secretions. Remember we called nerve agents cholinesterase inhibitors. To understand what it means to be a cholinesterase inhibitor, we've got to understand a little bit of anatomy and physiology of our nervous system. So the most basic unit in our nervous system in our nerves is what's called a neuron neurons are what send impulses to each other to make things happen so the neuron will have a synapse and that's going to release so if this neuron this nerve is coming from our brain and it wants to go on to innervate something like a muscle it's going to send you know its impulse to another neuron via these synapses and they're going to get picked up by the dendrites of the receiving neuron. And then this neuron will go on to innervate the muscle and make the action happen. To communicate with this other neuron, it's got to release a chemical called, you know, a neurotransmitter. And the most common neurotransmitter we're going to see, especially in our peripheral nervous system, is what's called acetylcholine. So it's going to release this acetylcholine, and this acetylcholine is going to get picked up by the dendrites of the receiving nerve, and that's going to send the impulse through that receiving nerve. And like I said, if this nerve goes on to innervate a muscle, if it goes on to innervate your diaphragm, it's going to make it constrict or do its action. So notice here, we still have some leftover acetylcholine in what's called the synaptic space. That's okay. As long as everything's functioning, we should have the uh, an enzyme present called cholinesterase and cholinesterase is going to come take care of that remaining acetylcholine well what did we call a nerve agent we called it a cholinesterase inhibitor so if we reset the nervous system here synapse dentrite dentrite um, acetylcholine acetylcholine's released triggers the nerve the nerve has its action we got our cholinesterase coming to neutralize the remaining acetylcholine but what happens we got poisoned by a nerve agent. A nerve agent is going to bind 
to all that cholinesterase. So that cholinesterase cannot neutralize this acetylcholine. So what's going to happen? We're going to get bombarded by acetylcholine. And when our nerve gets bombarded by acetylcholine, it's just going to keep firing and firing and firing and firing. And that's why we're going to get these things. That's why we're going to get these symptoms. That's why we're going to have meiosis. We're going to have a sudden loss of consciousness. We're going to go into convulsions because your muscles are being triggered and triggered and triggered by acetylcholine. And your cholinesterase is all bound up by the nerve agent. It can't be neutralized. Um, after this, after a while, everything's going to start giving out. That's why you're going to go into apnea. You're going to stop breathing because your diaphragm is just going to be worn out. And then you're going to go into flaccid paralysis, and then we're going to see copious secretions from the nose, mouth, lungs, and you'll see them everywhere else. I don't know why it doesn't mention it in this chapter, but you're going to be losing secretions from everywhere. Treatments available for nerve agent casualties will include atropine, 2-PAM chloride, and diazepam. Atropine is an acetylcholine blocker. It's going to block up some of that excess of acetylcholine found in the synaptic space. And this is the drug of choice for treating nerve agent poisoning. 2-PAM chloride is going to remove the nerve agent from the enzyme cholinesterase. It's going to free up that enzyme so it can actually go and neutralize acetylcholine. And then your diazepam, well, that's just volume. That's just a muscle relaxer. It's not really an antidote, but it uh, will help with some of the symptoms by helping with the convulsions. So the forms our antidotes are going to be available in. We've got the Mark I kit, the Antana, right, the A-T-N-A-A. -A, that stands for Auto Injector Treatment Nerve Agent Antidote. And then Arcana, which stands for Convulsive Antidote Nerve Agent. So your Mark I, it's going to have the atropine and the 2-PAM chloride in the form of two auto-injectors. It's going to supply 2 milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of 2-PAM chloride per the two auto-injectors. Your auto-injector treatment nerve agent is going to have the atropine and the 2-PAM chloride in a single auto-injector, and it provides 2.1 milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of 2-PAM chloride. And then again, your canna, that's just diazepam. That's 10 milligrams of diazepam. Another name for diazepam is just volume. It's just a muscle relaxer. So the physiology of how these nerve agent antidotes are going to work. Let's go back to our neuron. You got the synapse, we got the dendrite, we've got the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. It's going to innervate the uh, receiving nerve. The nerve is going to execute its action. The cholinesterase is going to come to mute the remaining acetylcholine, but this patient has been poisoned by a nerve agent. The nerve agent is going to bind to the cholinesterase. Okay, but we're going to be Johnny on the spot with our atropine, right? And our atropine is going to go ahead and take care of that remaining acetylcholine. And then we're also going to give them some 2-PAM chloride. That 2-PAM chloride is going to go ahead and uh, break the nerve agent off of the cholinesterase. And once the, once the uh, cholinesterase is unbound from the nerve agent, it can then go on to do its job and take care of the rest of the acetylcholine. And the patient will stop convulsing. So we're going to talk about treatment in the form of self-aid and buddy aid and then in a minute we'll talk about what medical providers can do so self-aid buddy aid is going to start with um donning protective masks as soon as there's a threat of a nerve agent attack we've got to make sure you know you don't become a casualty yourself so don your protective mask first if the patient is showing symptoms of a nerve agent you got to administer one mark one kit uh, intramuscularly into the lateral thigh hold in place for the at least 10 seconds just like an epipen Wait 10 to 15 minutes to see if the symptoms subside. If symptoms continue, administer another Mark I. A total of three kits can be administered at 10 to 15 minute intervals. If a patient has severe symptoms, you can give them all three of their kits immediately and also give them a dose of diazepam. Give them the canna as well. When it comes to medical personnel, medical personnel um, if symptoms persist after the three auto-injectors that they receive during self-aid and buddy aid, they can um, continue to administer two milligrams of atropine at five to ten minute intervals until a reduction in secretions and dyspnea, until atropinization has occurred. Um, if severe symptoms still occur after one hour, an additional three uh, Mark I kits can be given, atropine and 2-PAM chloride, but we cannot give more than six doses of 2-PAM chloride. 
And if your convulsions continue after 10 minutes of the initial injections of uh, of uh, diazepam or the canna, a second dose can be administered. A third dose can be administered five to 10 minutes after the second. So you can do, um, we can continue giving atropine in five to 10 minute intervals until we see a decrease in secretions and dyspnea. We can give up to six doses of the 2-PAM chloride and we can give up to three doses of the diazepam for medical personnel. So to review what we've gone over so far, Pharmacologically, the nerve agents are known as blank inhibitors. Pharmacologically, nerve agents are known as cholinesterase inhibitors. Right? They bind to that enzyme cholinesterase, and it cannot neutralize the remaining acetylcholine in the synaptic space. What are the nerve agents? What are the nerve agents? Well, we've got VX, Taboon, Sarin, Somin, and Cycloserin. What medication is given for nerve agent poisoning and acts by removing the nerve agent from the enzyme acetylcholinesterase? What removes the nerve agent from cholinesterase? What medication did that? That was 2-PAM chloride. 2-PAM chloride removes the nerve agent from acetylcholinesterase. It frees up the enzyme. Think of your 2-PAM chloride as 2-PAM crowbar. It removes the nerve agent from the cholinesterase. What medication is found in the convulsive antidote nerve agent, your canna? Diazepam, 10 milligrams. What is the drug of choice for treating nerve agent poisoning? The drug of choice, atropine. And if it comes in our Mark I, it'll be in two milligrams. If it comes in our antenna, our ATNAA, it'll be in 2.1 milligrams. What medications are found in the Mark I antidote kit? What medications are found in the Mark I antidote kit? That is atropine, two milligrams, and 2-PAM chloride, 600 milligrams. Moving on now to our blister agents. Our blister agents are gonna cause blisters. Our blister agents are gonna include mustard, nitrogen mustard, distilled mustard and lewisite and these guys are going to produce these large painful blisters that are incapacitating and um, they're usually classified as non-lethal a very high dose especially if we get them into the lungs can be lethal but by and large for the most part we classify these as non-lethal and remember something is non-lethal if it has a less than 10 percent casualty rate our blister agents are also known as vasecants um, and that's because another name for a blister is a vesicle, right? A big fluid filled blister. Another name is a vesic uh, vesicle. So sometimes you hear them referred to as vesicants. Mustard agents can be deployed as a vapor and a liquid. They are often oily, colorless, or a pale yellow. They may smell like garlic, mustard, or horseradish. Lewisite is said to smell very similar to geranium. Uh, eyes are the most vulnerable part, and a lot of times your early symptoms are going to be a gritty feeling in the eyes with photophobia. Photophobia means a sensitivity to light. We're going to see swelling of the eyelids, damage to the cornea, moderate to severe pain. And then our skin's going to develop erythema, right? Redness and blisters in about 12 hours, but it can be delayed up to 48 hours after exposure. And the areas affected are usually the warm areas, like the armpits, the groin, the face, and the neck. Inhalation can cause a sore throat, sinus pain, and hoarseness. Uh, it can also give you a hacking cough, then a, a productive cough, and shortness of breath. And as it gets down in the lungs, we're going to see things like crackles and rails. We're going to get those really bad uh, lung sounds that indicate fluid down in the lower airways. And then the primary cause of death, if you do get a lethal dose of it, is massive edema or a mechanical pulmonary obstruction. You, you start to get all sorts of fluid down in the alveoli and you have pulmonary edema and you can't move any air. You can't exchange your oxygen and your carbon dioxide and, and that's how they can kill you. Treatment for blister agents. Well, if we have systemic involvement of lewisite, if we have a massive exposure to lewisite, 
there is a antidote called British anti-leucocyte. And with British anti-leucocyte, we got to make sure that we do not give it to patients who are allergic to peanuts. But for most part, our, our uh, muster agents have no specific antidote. Our efforts are going to be focused on decontamination. So decon with the M291 skin decontamination kit. And we find that if we decon somebody within the first two minutes, this will reduce the toxic, toxic effects by more than 50%. If you don't have an M291 decon kit, a skin decontamination kit, we also have soap and water available, or we can use a 0.5% hypochlorite solution, and we can get a 0.5% hypochlorite solution by uh, mixing, diluting household bleach with a 1 to 2 ratio to water. So one part's bleach, 10 parts water, that'll give us about a 5% solution of hypochlorite of some bleach. Moving on to the blood agents, also known as the cyanides. We've got two blood agents we're going to talk about, hydrogen cyanide, AC, and cyanogen chloride. Cyanides have a very long history, and there's a number of ways they can be produced. Cyanide can actually be produced from the pits of peaches or the pits of cherries, and it's been a weapon of assassins. It's been a weapon of execution for a long time. In ancient Egypt, they used to distill it, like I said, from uh, the pits of peaches, and they used to call it the penalty of the peach, and they could execute you that way uh, by distilling cyanide from a bunch of uh, peach pits. The way it works is it's going to disrupt oxygen utilization at the cellular level, causing cellular suffocation. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. They are very rapid acting and they are lethal. This is considered a lethal uh, agent. They are widespread and they're found in the chemical synthesis of wool, rubber, polyurethane, polyurethane silk, and insulation. So people might get cyanide poisoning accidentally a lot of times it's seen in firefighters um and it used to be it used to happen like in polyurethane couches um when they'd catch on fire a firefighter would go in there and will maybe not have their uh, scba on and they'd get exposed to this burning couch and it'd be releasing cyanide and you could get cyanide poisoning from burning material you don't see it as much anymore but it's still a, a byproduct of a lot of um you know a lot of uh, synthesis like a lot of chemical synthesis and industrial processes um, cyanide likes to bind with certain metals like ferrous, like iron and cobalt, okay? So that's why it it causes cellular suffocation. Now, there's a misconception because, we, you know, we call them the blood agents that it only binds with the iron in your hemoglobin, but that's not the case. We're going to talk about it. We also have uh, uh, iron uh, enzymes in all of our cells, in the mitochondria of all our cells, so cyanide causes cellular suffocation to all of your cells, not just your red blood cells. And then uh, your hydrogen cyanide is said to have smelled like bitter almonds. That's a bitter almond smell. Problem is if you smell it, you're, you're probably going to die. It's very volatile. That means that um, at room temperature, it quickly turns into a vapor. And that makes it effective, especially like the assassins can throw it in somebody's face. At room temperature, it turns into a vapor and it, it'll kill them quickly. It has a rapid onset of symptoms. So the mechanism of cellular respiration. Real briefly, um, little biology review. Cells want some glucose, they want some uh, oxygen, they also need some water, but they're gonna take these things and they're gonna go into the mitochondria. If we remember from biology, the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, and under the mitochondria, the, uh, all these ingredients are gonna go through what's called glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain, and out they're gonna spit the energy that the cell needs to function, right? That adenotriphosphate, ATP, also a little bit of CO2, a little bit of lactic acid, but we'll breathe that out when we go to exhale. Um, so taking a deeper look into the mitochondria, remember that last part of cellular respiration was the electron transport chain. This is the final part of cellular respiration. This is a part where ATP is produced, the energy that the cell needs to survive. Um, there's several chemical reactions that occur uh, involving many enzymes. And one of those is the ferrous, the iron enzyme, cytochrome C. Um, cyanide readily binds with cytos, the enzyme cytochrome C oxidase, which is responsible for the production of ATP. So when we take those ingredients, so these right here represent our cytochrome C. These are iron-like uh, enzymes, and cyanide likes to bind with those. So when we have a cyanide poisoning, 
it's going to bind to all that enzyme and now we cannot make ATP. We cannot utilize oxygen and the cell will die. And that's how a cyanide works. So the signs and symptoms of somebody uh, exposed to a cyanide or a blood agent. Very, very rapid onset. They're going to have a transient increase in the rate and depth of breathing because of that cellular hypoxia. Right, it, the first response is going to have a, a real quick increase in the rate and the depth of breathing. They're going to have an increased heart rate and blood pressure as a result of that. If we're breathing faster, we've got to move more blood to the alveoli of the lungs, so the heart rate needs to go up to, to uh, compensate. As the hypoxia starts to affect things like the brainstem, we're going to go into convulsions. As things like the medulla oblongata experience hypoxia the low cellular or oxygen you're going to go into apnea you're going to stop breathing because that's you know where the seat of respiratory control is finally you're going to go into cardiac arrest because of everything that happened so we're going to break down we're going to break down what happens when somebody is exposed to a cyanide so in our vessels, we have these things called chemoreceptors, especially in the aorta and the carotid arteries. And what these chemoreceptors do is they detect the amount of oxygen in our blood. When we're exposed to a cyanide, these tissues are going to be very sensitive to that cellular hypoxia, to that lack of oxygen. They're going to send a signal to the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands can be found on top of the kidneys. In response to that, the adrenal glands are going to release some epinephrine, right? Some adrenaline. That epinephrine, right, is going to increase the rate and the depth of our breathing. It's going to try to get more air into us because we are experiencing that hypoxia. That epinephrine is also going to have an effect on our heart, right? It's our, our it's uh, adrenaline. It's going to increase the contractility, the strength in which it contracts, and the rate. As the hypoxia starts to get into our brainstem. Right? As we start getting cellular hypoxia at the brainstem, we're going to go into convulsions, and then we're going to have that what we call central apnea, meaning apnea that's happening because the medulla oblongata, that part of our brainstem that's responsible for our respiratory drive, is, is dying because it's not getting any oxygen. And then as a result, we're going to release even more epinephrine. Right? As we start to develop even more uh, hypoxia, we're going to release any, even more epinephrine. Well, that's going to put our heart in a dysrhythmia, and then we're going to go into cardiac arrest, and then we're going to die. And all this is going to happen pretty, pretty rapidly. Treatment for the blood agents and cyanides. First, we start with amyl nitrate ampules or sodium nitrate IV. Then, secondly, we need to give them an IV of sodium thiosulfate. The amyl nitrates, we can give two crushed uh, ampules at a time. We have them inhale them until we've given up to eight ampules of it. Our sodium nitrate IV, we can give 600 or 300 to 600 milligrams. Our sodium thisulfate, we give 12.5 milligrams of that. Okay, let's review what we've gone over so far. What chemical agents are cyanide-based and disrupt oxygen utilization, utilization at the cellular level? Cyanide-based and disrupt oxygen utilization at the cellular level. That are, those are our blood agents. Blood agents. What odor does hydrogen cyanide have? What odor does hydrogen cyanide have? It has the odor of bitter almonds. What is the treatment? for blood agent casualties. What is the treatment for blood agent casualties? We can give them amyl nitrate ampules, a max of eight, or IV sodium nitrate and IV sodium theosulfate. Okay, so amyl, amyl nitrate or IV sodium nitrate and sodium theosulfate. What are the blood agents? The blood agents are hydrogen cyanide and cyanogen chloride, AC and CK. Pharmacologically, the nerve agents are known as blank inhibitors, cholinesterase inhibitors. Pharmacologically, the nerve agents are known as cholinesterase inhibitors. What were our nerve agents? What were our nerve agents? Those were VX, Taboon, Sarin, Somin, and Cycloserin. What medication is given for nerve agent poisoning and acts by removing the nerve agent from the enzyme acetylcholinesterase? 
what medication is given for nerve agents and acts by removing the nerve agent from the enzyme acetylcholinesterase? Well, that was our 2-PAM chloride. 2-PAM chloride. What medication is found in the convulsive antidote nerve agent, the canna? What medication is found in your canna? Diazepam, 10 milligrams. What is the drug of choice for treating nerve agent poisoning? What is the drug of choice for treating nerve agent poisoning? That is atropine. And then what medication do we find in the Mark I antidote kit? We find two milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of 2-PAM chloride. Moving on to the pulmonary agents, sometimes called the choking agents. Well, we're gonna talk about phosgene or CG and chlorine with diphosgene. Chlorine is the first mass, the first chemical weapon used on a massive scale. This was used in World War I by the Germans, and the Germans, you remember that uh, World War I was trench warfare, and at that point, they were at a stalemate, and the Germans didn't realize how successful it was going to be. They didn't have the manpower to go in and take over all the trenches that they cleared out when they first used chlorine, uh, chlorine gas. So the way it works is it actually causes damage to the alveolar tissue. Remember the alveoli, the little sacs of, uh, they look like bunches of grapes at the end of your airway. That's where gas exchange occurs. That's the only place in your airway that gas exchange occurs. Your pulmonary agents, they don't suffocate you with the gas. The gas itself doesn't you know, cause you to, to die just because you're suffocating. The gas gets into your airway and it causes the airways to get inflamed and start leaking fluid into the alveoli and blood. So you die from pulmonary edema. You die from choking on fluid and blood. It's not just the gas suffocating you like when somebody gets like a carbon monoxide poisoning. You actually die a very painful death because you, you're pretty much drowning in, in blood and fluids from pulmonary edema. So at least the pulmonary edema, um, it's usually deployed as a vapor. It's heavier than air. So that's why it was so successful in World War I because you could deploy it and it would go down into the trenches. And they say that it smells like new mown hay. It has the odor of new mown hay. So like we were talking about the mechanism of action, the gas gets down into your airway, into these alveoli, and it causes them to fill up with fluid and blood, and, and that's what kills you. It's, it's, not, it's not suffocating like when somebody suffocates on carbon monoxide. It's, you die from massive pulmonary edema. So pulmonary agent symptoms. Usually takes about two to six hours after exposure. Your early symptoms, you're going to have irritation to the eyes, the nose, and the airways. Then it's going to progress, progress to cough, dyspnea, hoarseness, sneezing, wheezing, and chest tightness. And then your latent symptoms are going to include rapid and shallow labored breathing, a painful cough, cyanosis, frothy sputum. Right as you develop that pulmonary edema, as that fluid starts to fill up in your airways, you got you start coughing it up. You're gonna get into clammy skin, a rapid feeble pulse, and then a low blood pressure. You, you're gonna you're pretty much gonna go into shock. Treatment for these casualties is mostly supportive. We're gonna put an airway in them if we have to, and ventilate them, breathe for them if we have to. There is no antidote for the choking agents. It's mostly supportive. Keep them at rest. Provide an airway. Ventilate if you need to. Moving on to decontamination. Uh, principles of decontamination is to avoid spreading the contamination to clean areas. We need to manage our casualties without aggravating their injuries, but we also need to stop the spread of this chemical agent. So priority is gonna be first aid. We gotta control massive hemorrhage first. Treat life-threatening shocks. Decontaminate the exposed skin and eyes. Remove the contaminated clothing. Adjust the patient's mask if necessary, and then do your first aid for less severe shock and wounds. So massive hemorrhage and shock, those are our priorities. Because what good is it to decon somebody if, if we let them die? Okay, so your priority is first aid, massive hemorrhage, shock, then, de then decontaminate, then remove their clothes, make sure their mask is still working, and then we'll worry about those minor injuries 
uh, the less severe injuries. So your decontamination station is considered a dirty area. Um, each ship should try to have two decontamination stations if their whole design permits. It should be top side or somewhere that is well ventilated. Casualties should be decontaminated, undressed, showered, and then passed on to the clean areas. In the event of a chemical attack, ideally, you would set up decontamination this way. We would categorize our patients into the contaminated wounded and then our contaminated emergencies. Our contaminated wounded, um, they need to be in an area that's got free ventilation and some cover. We want to remove the contaminated clothing and gear. Patients are decontaminated and moved to clean receiving areas. So we're going to move them to the clean wounded. From there, they'll go to the treatment area. And from there, they'd be evacuated. Our contaminated emergencies. We need an area designated for emergency treatment of contaminated patients. Okay, These are the patients with that massive hemorrhage or with those signs of shock. Remember, we treat that first. Ideally, we would have an area to treat, that, treat them that way first Okay, because we're still treating dirty patients. All right, so uh, stabilize them, then decontaminate them. And because they are you know, a, a patient with massive hemorrhage or uh, being uh, treated for sh massive shock, well, then they go straight to the evacuation point after we've cleaned them. We would skip the clean wounded area and the treatment area for our, our minorly injured patients. All right, one more review. What odor is phosgene said to have? What odor is phosgene said to have? Phosgene has the odor, odor of pneumon hay. Pneumon hay. What are the pulmonary agents that we covered in this chapter? The pulmonary agents covered in this chapter, well, we talked about phosgene, chlorine, and diphosgene, right? C, G, C, L, and D, P. Phosgene, chlorine, and diphosgene. What chemical agents are cyanide-based and disrupt oxygen utilization at the cellular level? What chemical agents are cyanide-based and disrupt oxygen utilization at the cellular level? Those are our blood agents. What odor does hydrogen cyanide have? Hydrogen cyanide has the odor of bitter almonds. What chemical agent would you suspect in a patient with rapid, shallow, labored breathing, painful cough, cyanosis, and frothy sputum with a low blood pressure? Labored breathing, painful cough, cyanosis, frothy sputum, and a low blood pressure? Pulmonary agent. What's the treatment for our blood agent casualties? Blood agent casualties are going to receive amyl nitrate or IV sodium nitrate and IV sodium theosulfate. What are the blood agents? What are the blood agents? Hydrogen cyanide and cyanogen chloride. This concludes this presentation on medical aspects of chemical warfare. I hope this is helping with your advancement study and just your skills as a corpsman. Have a good one.